Well, today we're going to begin, we're starting a new series. Seven signs, seven miracles for the next seven weeks. And we're going to start with the first miracle that John records, and that's turning the water into wine. Now, it's in John that we only find this miracle. For some reason, the other ones didn't put it in. Um, but like they said, there are so much more that there, the books could not contain that everything that happened in the life of Jesus. But John found it important. And just remember, John is, is somebody, he's, he's written his gospel after all the other disciples and everybody else has written there. So he knows all the other ones that were probably written. He, he may have read them. So for some reason, he chose this miracle, this sign, to write down for us to hear this morning. So we'd like to look and see, what is John's message that he has for us? And John doesn't call, call them... Um, miracles in his gospel, he refers to them as signs. Because what are signs for us? Signs are something that, that give us direction. They point to something. So for some reason, John wants us to see what this sign has to do. And the, the first thing that we notice when we, when we look, that first, it's on the third day. John is, is very meticulous with everything that he has with all the, the symbols and metaphors and philosophy. He is very purposeful in his writing with what he includes and also what he doesn't include. Um, so everything with him tends to mean something. So it's a gospel that you have to go into, you have to read through, and you have to take time and really meditate uh, to pull out of it what's really in there. And we look at the, the wedding. First we notice that the wedding takes place on the third day. And in Jewish custom, in the, is in the Mishnah, one of the law books, that they'll have that when someone gets married, they would usually get married on a Wednesday or Thursday. If the woman was a young woman as a virgin, she'd get married on a Wednesday, the third day of the week. But if she was a widow that got married, then her wedding day would be on Thursday. If they didn't fall in those two categories, I don't know what day they celebrated on, or they maybe didn't have a celebration. But those were the two ones that, that were included. So we presume that this is probably a, a young couple. Um, and the wedding took place in, in Cana and Galilee. Cana was, it was a small area, a small town. And we noticed that people that were there, the only one that's named is Jesus. Nobody else is named. Even Mary, who, who's there, we know it's Mary because it's the mother of Jesus. We know that several of the disciples are there because he says disciples, so we know that there's more than one. So we know that there, Jesus has started his ministry. Um, but even the young couple, they're not mentioned. The only one that's mentioned by name is Jesus, but isn't that the one that's really the important one? Amen. Amen. And let me flip the pages. And they were invited, and with Mary there and Jesus there, there was probably someone that they knew, either a close friend or a relative, only because Jesus was there with his disciples as well as Mary. So it wasn't just somebody that, oftentimes weddings, that they'd invite the, the prominent rabbis, the prominent religious people. Um, but Mary was there too, and she was out there helping and serving and working. And the first thing we noticed that, that's going on in this wedding is that the wine ran out. I don't know, I'm sure most of us have probably hosted parties and gathering, and I know just with, with any kind of a gathering that you always worry about, is there going to be enough? You want to be enough food? You always make sure that there's abundance because we get worried, don't we? If, if we're going to have a party and what happens if we run out of food, how embarrassing that would be. And it was also embarrassing back then, but even back then it was even more so. It would be very socially humiliating. You don't want to be the wedding that they remember that they ran out of wine. And even at that time, there could even be legal action taking. Imagine you have a party and run out of wine and legal action could be taken. And so that was a big deal. And Mary knew this. And she was there and she was the first one that we see to realize this. So she wants to do something about it. And so she calls on, on Jesus. And she doesn't, she doesn't call on Jesus to say, Jesus, would you go get some wine? Jesus, would you perform a miracle? Jesus, would you fix this? She just lets him know we have no wine. And, you know, sometimes 
I know when I have my conversations with Jesus, I'm, I'm telling him what to do. I'm letting him know my problems, but I take that next step and I figure he may need some advice. So I'll also <laughs> tell him how I want this problem solved, how I want it fixed. And Mary doesn't do that. She sees that she just sees the problem and she just lets Jesus know we have no wine. And that she has faith. And she tells them, you know, that he, he just wants, she just needs his help. And she's letting him know that. And Jesus' response, some say, dear woman, some just say, woman? <laughs> Why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. And at first, this can seem a little short, a little curt, but it, it's, it's not. It's actually a very endearing way for Jesus to speak to his mother. And I say this for, for a couple reasons. One is, Jesus lived on this earth and he was obedient to his parents. He was perfect in every way. So I know that he wasn't being res disrespectful for that reason. And there's, there's another reason too that I know that Jesus was being, being very respectful because Jesus calls her woman one other time like this. There's only two accounts in John's gospel that Jesus speaks to his mother. And in, let's see, if we go to the end, where the, at the resurrection at the time of the cross, Jesus speaks to his mom. And he's on the cross, and, he's, and he says to her, Woman, woman, here is your son. And he's pointing to John. And John, here is your mother. That just always gets me a little bit. Because he's on the cross. He's at his last moments. And he's still taking care of some of his earthly business. He wants to make sure his mother's taken care of and he calls her woman. So I know for that that Jesus was very respectful with the way that he talked to his mother. From the beginning, his first miracle, to this last day on the, when he was there on the cross. And then Jesus, and after Jesus' response, the mother looks at the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. And they do. And they notice that nearby, there's, there's six jars, six ceremonial jars used for washing. And remember, numbers mean something in the Bible. The number seven means the sign of completion. And the number six also has meaning. And the number six stands for the number of incompleteness. And so how symbolic that the jars, the ceremonial jars used for washing are a sign of incompleteness. But Jesus, he's the sign of completeness. And so there's these six jars, and these were, I, I just imagine, they just like had to be pitched, I'm picturing like barrels, and there are six of them. And the ceremonial washing, they would take the jars, and they'd be filled up with water, and, and this wasn't just regular drinking water. This wasn't Evian water. This was nothing pure. This was just water that was used for washing. Because remember, dur during that time, people traveled around. They had sandals. They didn't have nice shoes to wear and socks. So their feet, when it was dry, they'd, of course, get dusty. And it was wet, they'd get muddy. So the first thing they do before any gathering, they'd go over to the ceremonial washing, and they'd go ahead. And first thing they'd do, they'd take care and they'd wash their feet. And then they'd go ahead and they'd wash their hands and they'd often say a little prayer, Rokata, Noya, Lamino, Melikalam. And then they'd go and do their first course. And after they were done their first course, they'd go back and there'd be another washing and another prayer. So they would go through a significant amount of the water. So it explains why there's a lot of water there. And my guess is this was probably a pretty big wedding as well. And so they have the servants go and they fill up the jars. Now I can't imagine they're picking up these jars and taking them to the local watering hole. My guess is they had small pitchers and, and were just filling them up and filled it up till they were overflowing. And then Jesus tells them, next he says, take it to the master of the banquet. The master of the banquet is one who, who tested everything. And they did. And imagine one of the servants <coughs> taking that, and I'm, 
I, I, I sometimes pause a little bit, and I just imagine if I was one of the servants and Jesus told me to take, we just filled these up with water. Not drinking water. We just filled all these jars up, and you want me to take this water that we're using for cleaning our feet and our hands, and you want me to take it, I'm thinking this is my head if I was a servant, and take it over to the master of the banquet and have him drink it? I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to be humiliated. I don't know if I want to do this. You know, all that would be going through my head. I don't know what was going through their head. Maybe they did but anyways, they took that, and they took it to, to him. Remember, Jesus didn't, didn't at any time say, I'm going to take this water and turn it to wine, or ta-da, there's wine there. There was none of that. So he's taking that. He's, he's dipping the water on, and he's taking it to the master of the banquet. I would have been a little nervous. And how relieved he must have been when he said, this is the choice wine. As a servant, I'm thinking, is he really drunk? <laughs> but this is the best wine ever. And how is it that Jesus can take what was meant for washing and turn it into the choice wine? The vintage wine, the best wine that ever tasted. And Jesus can do that. And he can do that with our lives. How he can take us and turn us into something even amazing. And we need to look at our lives. What do our lives look like? Do our lives look like the water? Which is not a bad thing. It's the, the, the ritual is not bad. But just remember, Jesus wasn't here to come and fulfill or, or to complete the law. He didn't come here for the law. He wasn't for that. Remember, once he turned this wine, there was no, there was no water for washing. You know, some of the people may have been appalled by that. But Jesus didn't come here about the law. And throughout the scriptures, we'll see that Jesus didn't come for the law. He came for something for so, so, so much more. He didn't came here, come here so we could be better religious people, be dutiful about our, our Christian acts, but he came so we could have glory. He came so we could have joy. C.S. Spurgeon said that something like, that it's important we will draw more people to heaven by us wearing heaven on our face. If we want to draw people to Christ, they're going to draw, not because of the, 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 the religious acts that we're doing, but by the joy that we have in our lives. That they can see us go through us having surgeries and cancers, and yet we don't fall. We're helping to pick one another up. The early churches, that's how they got people to join. Not because wonderful sermons or wonderful acts, but because they saw the love that they had for one another. They saw the giving that they had for one another and the joy that they had for one another. And I think that's what Jesus wants for us too. To see what he can do for us. That he can transform us from the, from the water into the most precious wine. So what would our lives look like and what would our church look like if we let Jesus, with his glory, transform us into something wonderful, into something joyful? Do people look at us and do they see the joy of the Lord? Do they see the glory that God has given us on our face? As we go through our, our days, we go through our life when we're out in the community, I hope that we, we pay attention to what, how we're doing and how we're presenting ourselves. Are we presenting ourselves that we have been transformed by Jesus? Yeah, I hope that someday, you know, the people all over the community, they'll, they'll see us, they'll see us, and they'll wonder, what is it about them? That they'd be drawn to us because of our glory that we've gotten through Jesus. So as the days to come, we'll have times when maybe we feel like our water, that our lives are like the water. But if we just remember what we need to go back to, remember what Jesus can do for us, 
that our lives can be like the choice wine. No, things don't always go right. Things don't always go our way. But we can have that feeling inside and that strength inside, no matter what we go through, that Jesus is there and he's there to transform us. Dear Lord, we thank you for your message. We thank you for everything that you've given us. We're grateful to see the transformation, not only that you performed at that, that wedding at Cana, but the transformation that you've done in our own lives. And help us to remember to be grateful for those things and to give us the strength that we can continue through all the trials in our life to remember to show your glory in our actions. And all Jesus' people said, Amen. Amen.